uh, I won't say that at third service because I only get, to, I think we taped that one. So anyways, well, I'm honored to be here and be able to, to share today uh, from the word. And uh, I have to start just by this confession. God is not joking. The author of Hebrews 4, the whole book, but Hebrews 4.12, they're not joking when it says that the word of the Lord is sharper than a two-edged sword and that cuts between spirit and soul, bone and marrow. The word is sharp, <laughs> and it cuts. This morning as I come, I have some uh, surgical wounds that the Lord has been doing using his word to bring refining. So if you smell smoke and you smell something burning, this message is coming from a place of the Lord is doing something in me and refining me, so don't get too close, uh, or, or you may get burned. The other confession I have to make is be very careful when someone asks you to preach. Be careful of your answer. Be careful to say yes. Because when you say yes, the Lord loves to use the topic you're going to preach as the place he wants to do a work in your life. And so it has been amazing to go, I just want to tell people what to do. I don't want to have to do this stuff. Why, Lord, are you making me the object of your sermon? So I come today not to tell you what to do, but I just want to share some findings out of the book of, of 1 Peter and something that the Lord has been doing in me for the last few months. My friend Jay, who plays guitar here, he's an awesome guy. I really love him, grateful for him. About two months ago, we were talking on the phone, and I thought it'd be cool, like a boulder ride. I had my little earpiece in. I was riding my bike and, 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 uh, and on the phone, and, and I think that's illegal. But um, as we're going, Jay's like, I really feel like the Lord's given me a, a, a scripture for you. And I'm like, this is awesome. What's it going to be? It's like, you're going to be a great man, a great nation, lots of money, really famous, and everything's going to go well. I'm waiting for that passage, though I haven't read that one yet, but I'm waiting for it. Like, that's what the Lord has for me. I'm like, hit me, Jay. And this is what he said. He says, he's like, I really believe this is a passage for you. So, um, he says, it's in First Peter. I said, uh-oh. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. I said, thank you, Jay. That's a really nice word. I received that because that's the right thing to do when someone says they have something for you. I said, oh, that's great. And as I began to look around in my life, the Lord began to make that passage become a reality. Week and a half after that, Gene and Brian said, hey, do you want to preach in the Driven by Hope series? I said, yes, I do. And then three days later, they said, here's the passage we want you to preach. Let me, well, let me give you the passage they wanted me to preach. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil, reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. So I've said, Lord, I get the idea. And then, so I got these passages, I've got the word, I've got, this is my assignment, and then relationships in my life begin to get somewhat rocky. And I think I'm a pretty nice guy. A lot of people seem to like me. I'm funny, I'm, uh, you know, looking, and, um, and, and, you know, usually, generally, I get along with people, but all of a sudden, I'm getting these amazing God encounter opportunities to apply this passage. And what I'm finding is most of the time in life, I don't operate by this passage, but I operate by this juvenile, primitive approach to conflict with people called fight or flight. That is something that's been woven into our fabric, fight or flight, right? If you're being attacked by a tiger, fight or flight is great. If you are being attacked by a shark, fight or flight is right. But when we're relating to one another, fight or flight is not the greatest approach to that. And so I find myself that I come into a situation where, you know, you bump into someone or you begin to have some sort of conflict and varying layers of relationship. And I think, hey, I think I handle these things very well. But what the Lord is beginning to do is put, this is what it looks like. So instead of me running at it to fight 
or running away from it. He's saying there's a better way. The Lord wants more for us than to operate by this primitive instinct of fight or flight. He wants more from us. He's elevating it to say, you guys can do better than that, than just fighting each other and leaving each other. There's better things that you can do with that. So the Lord has been taking me through this journey and giving me opportunities where I see, you know what? Lord, please continue to refine me at your word. So I got some scars that haven't healed over, and I got some stitches still from the word of God as he's beginning to do a work with his double-edged sword to refine me to be more and more like him. I love the fact that I'm not alone, though. Because when I read the scriptures, I see, oh, good. I'm just glad that I'm not the only person that's ever gone through this. And as we look at the bo- in the book of 1 Peter, Peter is dealing with a group of people that are beginning to bump up into some situations that are pretty difficult. They're beginning to enter into some rough situations. Some of them have headed into such rough situations that they're experiencing physical harm and persecution. And others of them are just beginning to experience internal tension within their group. And so Peter writes this book. And one of the things I love about this letter that he writes is he writes it in such a way that it's dual expression. One of the values that I love about Cornerstone and coming here and being grafted a part of this community is this idea of dual expression. That we are followers of Jesus Christ. And some of us come from a Jewish tradition, a rich Jewish heritage. And are, are coming to Jesus and know Jesus from there. As well as others who are not Jews, who are, who are, are what Scripture calls Gentiles or everybody else. Um, 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 but, but, but this chosen people and how it's woven together in such a way. And Peter is taking both groups and he's saying, hey guys, you Jews and you uh, Greeks... I got to tell you how you're to act because what's happening is you're experiencing persecution and the heat's being turned up and tension is beginning to come and you're better than just fight or flight. You're better than just fighting each other or leaving one another. And so Peter writes these words to the people. I want to get to this. And he starts off his letter in such a beautiful way. I love how Peter writes this. Because Peter doesn't just come out and say, hey, cut it out. This is how you need to behave. He validates the experience the readers are having. He says, I understand things are tough. And it's, it's, it's called to attune to someone. And what he's doing is he's stepping into the situation. He's saying, I want to attune to you. And I want to connect with you to say, you know what? It's, it is hard. It is hard for you to be a people that used to be amongst the same people, and now you're in a foreign land, and now there's these other people that don't have the same history and heritage you, and you're to be called family. That is tough. And there's other people you used to get along with that you're now, and so he comes alongside them, and he validates to say, things are rough, guys. Things are really rough. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just settle into this place of let's just sulk about it. He goes into and he begins to move into this thing where he's amazing. He says, you know what? Things are rough, but let me tell you who you are. Let me remind you of who you are. And so Peter goes through his letter in the beginning, and Brian and Gene have done a phenomenal job of this, and I'm just going to remind us of this. Peter doesn't just jump into the situation and say, here's how you have to act. He says, I realize you're in tough times. And then he says, but let me remind you who you are. And he begins to say things like, you're a ransomed people who have been bought by a price. You're ransomed. You've been bought. And then he says, you've been chosen. You're elect. And then he says, you're holy. He says, you're a royal priesthood. Now, for the Jews who would have read this to go, hey, that's only a select group. And he says, because of Jesus, now everybody gets to be a part of that. And then he says, you're God's precious possession. So before diving in to deal with their behavior, he reminds them of their identity. It's kind of like when the sun comes out, and I've said this before, I think, in the, I don't know when it was, but sometime I've said it. Um, You know, when you're driving into the valley and it's just covered with fog and you can't see anything, you can't see flat irons, you can't see pearls, you can't see anything. But the sun begins to come out, and it burns away the fog, and you see clearly. What Peter is doing is he doesn't just dive in to address behavior. He says, you know what? It is tough. And then he reminds them who they are, burning off the fog of frustration, burning off the pain of, of persecution. He says, you're a royal priesthood. You're ransomed. You're a holy nation. 
And he reminds them to say, hey, you've been born again. Some scholars believe that the book of 1 Peter was actually a baptismal liturgy, that when people were being baptized, they'd read this. Some believe that, some don't. (laughs) Reminding them that you've been born again. You have a new life. Your life is just not limited to now. It is a life that is eternal through Jesus. It is the fact that the spirit of the living God that hovered over the waters of creation that inspired the words of God, that have done miracles, that that conceived Jesus, that raised him from the dead, that came in power at Pentecost. He's reminding them to say, you know that spirit? It dwells in you now. You have a new spirit. You're part of a new family. Welcome to the family. You're grafted in together. You belong. And so he reminds them of all these things. And he also reminds them to say, hey, remember when you weren't a people? Now you're a people. Remember when you were stuck in unhealthy passions that were ruining your life? Well, you collided with Jesus, and now you don't do that. And now that's not the issue. And then he says, let me remind you of something as well. Not only your identity, not only your history, not only your, new, your reality, but let me remind you of your destiny. You have a future and an inheritance that, by the way, you did nothing to get, but this is all yours that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. It's kind of a brilliant way to deal with the situation, isn't it? You know what? It is tough. But let me remind you who you are. And then he begins to go. And he begins to move into his letter. And like an amazing songwriter, Peter, or, or the, the person that, that, that scribed this, this letter, he crafts it in such a way, like some of the songs that, that Kate wrote, which were absolutely beautiful um, this morning. Thank you, Thank you, Kay, for that. And, and Peter writes his letter in such a way that it's almost like verse 1, verse 2, and then it crescendos up to this place of just a chorus that just belts out, and it grabs the attention and the affection of the people. And Peter, in his letter, you can almost hear the drums beating behind it as it's building and building and building. And in chapter 3, 8, and 9, he says, finally, to sum it all up, listen to this, finally, to sum it all up, have unity of mind. Sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and the music is continuing to go behind it. Not literally, but that's what happens in my crazy head. I hear it happening. And it's building and building, and it says, have a tender heart, a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, bless, for that is what you've been called to, that you may obtain a blessing. He says, this is the pinnacle of what I've been trying to say. More than fight or flight, this is how you are to interact as people. Because conflict is inevitable. I don't like conflict. I want everyone just to get along. I can sense tension three counties away. I'm like, if anybody ever read the little fable, Princess and the Pea, I am that person. I just feel the tension in a room. I hate it. And what Peter's saying, you don't have to live like that. This is how we behave. This is how you are called to behave. Because of who Jesus is and because of what Jesus has done, this is who you are. Then finally, act this way. And he begins to talk to to them. And he lays out these five virtues for how we are to relate to one another in relationship that take the fear out of relationships. No longer is it an outcome of I'm just waiting for fight or flight. It goes, no, I now know how to navigate relationships with people. And he's specifically talking about relationships with other followers of Jesus, regardless of what tradition you come from and regardless of where you're at on the journey. This is how you relate to one another. Have unity of mind. Have sympathy. Have brotherly love. Have a tender heart. And have a humble mind. I'd like to spend the next little while, not rambling, I'll pray that I don't, but looking at these five virtues for how we are to live our life in relationship. As he said, we are all these things. Now he comes to this point and he says, it matters how you treat one another. Isn't it crazy that the Ten Commandments, four of them are about relationship with God, and then the rest of them are about relationship with each other? He's like, hey, listen, this is how you treat me. But I know it's going to be troublesome for you to treat each other, so here's how you treat one another. Top ten. Four, relationship with him. Six, relationship with one another. What that says is it matters to our relationship with God how we treat one another. 
And so Peter's saying, hey, it really matters how we treat one another. He says the first thing you got to do is you got to get on the same page. You have to have unity of mind. And this is not just compromise. He's not saying you get half of what you want and half of what they want. It's like a radio station that plays all kinds of music. No one's ever happy. It's like, well, I got to endure the rest of these 10 songs before I get to one I like. He's not saying that at all. He's saying take your opinion out of it completely. Get a new perspective and then enter it in. Get on the same page and get on God's page. Look at things from God's perspective. Move beyond your opinions and your desires and be united by a common vision and values. Who gets to decide on those common vision and values? God. That are motivated by God's word. That are motivated by God's spirit and that are motivated by God's Son, Jesus, our Messiah. He, we don't just enter onto the same page in such a way to go, you need to understand me, but we look at things from a completely different. God's outcomes in a situation are oftentimes different than ours. It says his ways are higher than our ways. be kind of interesting in translation. It says his outcomes are higher than our outcomes. His measurable, uh, <laughs> anyways, you know where I'm going with that. Those are all good things, but the idea of entering into conflict, we back up and enter into relationships, and we go in to say, I want to have the vision and the values of God as I enter into interacting with one another, not just how I want to. Have you ever had a conversation with someone, and the way you define a word was different? You're saying the same word. They define it one way. The other defines it. It's, I think sometimes it's called marriage. So it, it's just, you know, but, but, one, but one of the key things is to go, time out, time out, time out, time out, everybody sit down. What do you mean by that word? Well, this is what this word means. Oh, that's great, because I thought this is what it means, and let me get the dictionary and show you why I'm right. Just kidding. <laughs> that's wrong. That's shame on me. Edit the video. But one of the things we need to do is begin to go, hey, when we're using words, when we're using language, when we're relating to one another, let's have the same definition, and that's God's definition of what that's to look like. Peter is saying, you could do better than the cultures around you. You could do better than fight or flight. Get on the same page. Have unity of mind. That's the first step. The next is get in their shoes. Have sympathy and compassion on another. I love Philo of Alexandria, and I do need to correct the spelling of that. Please forgive me. He said, he said this quote, and it's been attributed to different people, but most, most scholars believe this is, he said this. He says, be kind. For everyone you meet is fighting a great battle. Be kind. Everybody's fighting a battle. And if we approach the individual to go, you got a whole bunch of baggage. You probably got a whole bunch of dreams and a whole bunch of disappointment. Are you laughing? Did I spell something wrong? Yeah, it's pretty terrible. I'm embarrassed. Ignore my spelling, and, and this is what I'm trying to say. But the idea of, of this is, 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 is when we approach someone to realize the baggage, realize the fact that this individual is probably dealing with shattered dreams as much as you're dealing with shattered dreams. They're probably dealing with frustrations in relationship as much as you're dealing with frustrations in relationship. So enter it in with compassion. One speaker who uh, um, was watching on a TED Talk, and she was awesome, and she was, uh, she was a... a uh, a, a Buddhist, and she was talking about this idea of compassion, and she'd work with people on death row, and people in hospice, and people that were in situations where death was inevitable. And one of the things she said is, she said, compassion cannot have an outcome attached to it. To enter into compassion, you can't have a fix on the other end. Because compassion, as Henry Nouwen said, one of my favorite writers and authors, he said the definition of compassion is to suffer with. We enter into the situation and just suffer with the person. It's not pity where we feel bad for you. We are feeling bad with you. Does that make a difference? When someone feels bad for you, thank you. Don't feel bad for me. But if someone who loves you enters into the situation and says, let me feel bad with you. Let me carry this with you. When we interact with people that way, it is revolutionary. That we're not just trying to fix them. But we're trying to enter into the situation and love them in the midst of it. Peter is brilliant through the Spirit to tell us this is how you need to treat one another. Have unity of mind and have sympathy. 
We move into the next virtue that, that Peter speaks to the people in his, his great crescendo in the letter. He says, have brotherly love. And this sounds kind of like, oh, that's, you're my brother. And, and it's, it's one of those things that on first reading, it's kind of like, that's cute. That's nice. That's, that's fun. A lot of times they'll say love one another. But when we dig behind that and we read the context in which he's saying, it holds a ton of weight. Because what it's saying is care for one another as if they are family. Because guess what? They are family. When you interact with a person who is a follower of Jesus Christ, you come from the very same bloodline as them, regardless of race, regardless of experience, because you've been grafted in to the bloodline of Jesus. So we treat one another as family. In ancient culture, there was a kinship ethos, a kinship code for siblings that's very different than ours now. Sibling rivalry, in many ways, was viewed upon, and history even looks at it, as a great evil. It was evil. Because what they viewed it as is the relationship between siblings is a manifestation of an individual's love for their parents. I show my parents how much I love them by the way I treat my sibling. Because how I treat my sibling promotes our family honor, our family system, our family reputation, and I want that to be good in the city. So how I treat my brother, how I treat my sister shows how much I love my father and how much I love my family. When I read that, it destroyed me to go, oh, my word. John, Peter, Paul, everybody else, that's what you were talking about. That how we treat one another is a direct manifestation of how we love our Father, our Heavenly Father. And that's why it's so important. And Peter is offering to them, he says, don't be in competition. Cooperate with one another. Get used to them. They're going to be around. Just like... You know, you don't get to choose always your siblings. I didn't choose my brother-in-laws, but they're family. If they're watching, I like you guys. The fact is of being able to relate them in such a way that there is a commitment to one another out of an individual's commitment to Christ. When I commit to Jesus, I'm committing also to the followers of Jesus. David DeSilva, who's a professor at Ashland Theological Seminary, says rivalry competition and working against a brother or sister is is as unnatural as and dysfunctional as for one hand to break what the other hand builds, or for one foot to trip up the other. It's unnatural. Plutarch, who was a, a philosopher, and he was talking about, well, what, what, what if one sibling rises to a greater stature than another? He says, well, this is how you handle it. You adorn them a portion of your favor. You bring them to that status as well, and you share in that. And you adopt them into your friendships. Instead of using your siblings as stepping stones to something greater, you elevate them. My daughters and I love to watch Cake Boss and Duck Dynasty. I'm working on a Duck Dynasty costume for uh, next Halloween, and I'm going to get pretty close, I think. It's the beard, the hair, get it? Twelve people saw the show. It's a very educated crowd in Boulder. <laughs> Anyways. Um, um, but... But one of the things there is you see the family relationships in which the commitment to one another and how you interact with them. And I love this idea that Peter is saying to the followers who are scattered in different cities, who are being outcast by some of their own family members of, of their own that, that they've grown up with. Some of their own uh, uh, relationships they're being separated from. They're saying, listen, you're a new family. And this is how families treat one another. Love your siblings as a representation of how you love your parents. We move into this other. He says, you need to to have a tender heart, a kind heart. And this is one of the places where, where a word is important because the Greeks would hear this word as one way and the Hebrews would hear this word from another. As the Hebrews hear this word that was used in different contexts, it would be quick for affection, quick to feel, quick of heart. The Greeks would hear this word in such a way to say, quick for courage, quick to be brave. And I love the fact that two audiences, he's bringing one word together, much like John did in the beginning when he used the word logos, but he's using a word to say the best of the Hebrews, quick for heart, for their passion, for their feeling, and the best of the Greeks, quick for bravery. And he brings it for this new concept to say, be bravely kind to one another. Kindness is one of the most revolutionary things, isn't it? It's terrifying. 
Instead of me in competition with you, I'm going to be kind to you. I think kindness is a lost art in our culture and our society. And not random acts of kindness, intentional acts of kindness. I can be real kind to people I don't have to live with. Because guess what? It's like, here's a coffee and a donut. I don't want to talk to you again. (laughs) But when I have to live with someone or work with someone or interact with someone to be kind with them, I have to be kind every day. And it's a brave thing to step past our callousness, to step past our competition and step into a kindness that is a new bravery. Got the chance um, a year ago to go to a, a, a monastery up in Chico, California. I was, you know, it was one of the times where I was like, I need to get away, hear from the Lord. I need, I need to know it was a decision whether we're going to move here. So I went to this, this monastery, and the advantage for this one and why I selected it was a, a monastery and winery. So it would be uh, this combination. I knew the Lord would really speak in some way. So, uh, <clears throat> so I went there. It was a beautiful experience, I think. Um, I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, but, but one of the things is I got to, to spend just a couple minutes with the guest master, and he's the person who directs the tours and tells people about what is going on and if you want to have, you know, hotel room there or whatever it's going on. I said, you know, I, I was there, and I was, you know, kind of enamored with what they were doing. I was like, tell me about how this impacted your spirituality. He's like, well, I don't go to church anymore. I was like, well, that may tell you a thing or two. But um, he said, but there is one thing. There are 50 men, 50 or 60 men that live in that house over there behind those walls. And these men have dedicated their lives to God and to each other. And those men are from the ages of 30 to 80. And you know what they're like? It's like, no. I was like, no, I have no idea. Like, that many men in a house from that age group is like, this needs a reality show. That'd be amazing. Like, monks unplugged or something, just the real world at the Abbey of New Clairvaux. Um, but he said they're kind. They're kind. They're marked by their kindness. And then he said, you know what? Men aren't kind, especially the older they get. He said men aren't kind. Usually they're beaten down by the world, their disappointments, their responsibilities, their frustrations, their desires, and they're not kind. But these men, they're kind. It was amazing that someone who didn't want much to do with the church anymore, other than run this the administrative part of a monastery, recognized in the lives of these men kindness. It's to say that kindness is revolutionary. And the Greeks of old and the Hebrews of old knew exactly the word to use. Quick to heart. Quick for courage. Not passive and wimpy, or like just be nice to everyone. Aggressive kindness that's been informed by compassion, that's been informed by brotherly love, that's been informed by being on the same page. And I will quickly move on. The last thing, well, the next thing that Peter says, he says, have a humble mind. And this is not talking about, like, turn your brain off. He's not just saying, like, just turn your brain off. He's saying, be brilliant. Be brilliant like Jesus. We look in Philippians, And it says these words, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. To humble your mind in such a way as to take, I have this status, but I will lower myself to meet you where you're at. I love St. Francis. I love stories about St. Francis. I just kind of enamored with, with him. And it was, there's a story that he was coming home after a journey and a variety of things going on with that. And he was riding on his horse. And as he came up over the hill, he got to the place and stood before him. He saw a leper coming towards him in rags. And St. Francis was proper. And he had style. He was, he was, you know, he just, he was a high, he, he loved parties, he loved his stature, he wanted to be nobleman, he wanted to be a knight, and he was someone that just ha- very much carried himself in that way. And as he came up over the hill, he saw this leper, but he had beginning in, to having these dreams and this conversion experience with God. And when St. Francis saw the leper, who he's like, oh, I don't want to touch that. I don't want to touch a leper. That's, that's below me. You know what St. Francis did? He got off his horse. Instead of running away or running at him, he got off his horse and walked over to the leper and embraced him. 
he humbled his mind and he humbled himself and embraced that which he was afraid of the most, and it transformed his life forever. He ended up having a great ministry to the lepers and so many other things. But I think it's a beautiful image, and it's something that Peter is saying to us through these words. Get off your horse. Get off your high horse. And humble yourself and meet people right where they're at. I wish, I wish it would be cool to verse stop there because that's what he's really talking about is how we as followers of Jesus, regardless of tradition, are to treat one another. But he shifts ever so slightly into verse 9. And he says, basically, this applies to everybody. So if someone's being mean to you, don't be mean back. Don't repay evil for evil, but repay evil with blessing. Bless. Well, what if they're mean? Bless. What if they're wrong? Bless. What if they're ruining my reputation? Bless. Why should I do that? Because your inheritance is to be a blessing. And so it changes everything. It's a new economy. It's a new way to relate one another. It's a new way instead of fight or flight, we now enter in. What do we have to lose? Because we are chosen and ransomed. We have a new life. We have a new spirit. We have an incredible hope. This is what we've been called to. And he says, finally, treat each other this way because how you treat one another is a direct manifestation of your love for God. It's not just better behavior. It's worship. The way you treat others is an act of worship. So this last week, um, a couple of friends of ours, Dan, uh, Ruddy and his wife, Melissa, and my wife and I, we went out and we were going to go to a concert. So we went to, sink, to the sink and then we went to the Fox Theater. We, we're all, all four of us are from other cities and states. So we felt very, very bolder to do those two things. And it was, it was a beautiful experience. But we went to see an artist that we, we all really like, Brett Denon. And we were waiting for it. And usually when you go to a concert, you endure the opening act. You're like, all right, all right. I ha- since it's uh, open seating, I'll go here. This person, well, this guy named Noah Gunderson, and his sister came out. I'm like, there's a dude and his sister playing at the Fox. This is interesting. Let's hear what he has to say. But he starts playing, and the most amazing and haunting sound becomes, comes out of him. And the room begins to shift in such a way that all ears, eyes, there's no one's moving. They're just watching and listening this. And he begins to move into this song that is incredibly haunting. And he says these words in such a way that just captivate the soul of the room. And he says, I was told to find Jesus in a stained glass church where the light shines red like blood. But the eyes of his children were so bitterly burned that I could not stand to look at them. When he finally came to visit me, he was dressed in the rags of poverty. And it came as no surprise. And it came as no surprise. When he got into that line about I was told to find Jesus in stained glass church, as he got that line, you could see some kind of snickering. But when he turned the corner on the lyric and he sang, but the eyes of his children were so bitterly burned, you almost heard a holy amen in the room from people who are not followers of Jesus who say, you know what, that's so right. That's my experience too. Now I'm reading into it. But I'm pretty intuitive to a room. When you see people going, yeah, that's right. And Noah was almost as if he was a prophet of old, standing on the stages to Israel to say, hey, guys, you're off track. The way you relate to one another is not representing your love for God. One of the things that in that room that was so apparent is the world is watching us. The world is watching the church. And you know what? They're not impressed with our songs. They're not impressed with our slogans. They're not impressed with our buildings. They're not impressed with our plans. They're not impressed because they've looked and they go, you know what? You guys can't even get along with one another. Why would I want to follow and be a part of a group of people that are mean to each other? That, that, that seem to be frustrated and angry at one another. It's interesting that most people aren't hung up on um, apologetics of, of the, the existence of God. Some are, but more, it's the empirical evidence of how people who are followers of Jesus treat one another. 
to go, there must not be something real there if it doesn't change the way you guys act. And that's exactly what Peter was doing. He was saying, you have an audience of the world looking at you, Jews and Gentiles who are followers of Jesus. You have an audience looking at you right now. And what they see is infighting. That's bad representation of the one who laid his life down to die for you. So one of the things, does that make sense? Am I off on that? Do you guys, is that what you hear from the world? Do you hear the same thing that they're not really impressed with the way we treat one another? Are we known as a compassionate people? Are we known as a sympathetic people who are united in mind and heart and in deed? Are we known as a people who treat one another in our group like family? Are we known as people who get off our high horse and meet people where we're at? Let me just say, I don't know about you, I'm not known like that. That's not the first things people say about me. You know, he's really brotherly love and humble of mind and a tender heart. But one of the things I think we have to do is begin to hear the crescendo of 1 Peter. Hear the crescendo of 1 Peter and, and let that song shape our lives. Because the world's watching how we love one another. They're also experiencing how we treat them. What I'd like to do is uh, Dan and the minstrels are going to uh, play and, and lead us into worship. I want to invite up our prayer ministry team who, uh, they just, they've been trained to, to pray with people, and to pray for people. And what I'd love us to do is kind of maybe change the lighting a little bit. And we've got five more hours before we got to go. And, and uh, I just want to step into this for a moment. But I have an apology to make. If you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're not um, someone who, who has put their faith in Jesus as Messiah, I'm sorry for the way I've treated my brothers and sisters. I've been a bad example. And I'm sorry for the way that my brothers and sisters who've been grafted into a new bloodline through Jesus have treated one another. We've been a terrible example, and I'm sorry. And we got to change that. Through the pages of the scriptures, through the power of the Spirit, through the presence of Jesus. If you are a follower of Jesus, I have a call to action for you. Here it is. Could we be united in mind? Can we be sympathetic to one another? Can we treat each other with love as family? Can we be bravely tender-hearted and kind? And can we get off our high horses and humble ourselves to meet each other where we're at? If you're in a place today where you uh, want to get some prayer for maybe something that came up in the message or through worship or the songs have been sung over us, please please come forward and, 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 and meet with someone that's on the prayer team now as we go into to this song.
continue to, to worship there may be some that are in the room that, 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 that they just can't get to that place yet of, of even talking about that the behavior or the interaction but they just need to be reminded and allow it to go past their mind and to their heart who God calls them and so if you're in that place today and just like I need that to go my identity to go past my mind to my heart to impact the rest of my life. I just pray you just open your hands up. I'm just going to bless you. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you may hear from the Father's voice past all of the voices that are around you. You are a child of the Most High. That you've been chosen. That you've been ransomed. That you're a prized possession, God. That you're a royal priest that you may receive that and that you may receive that hope and that inheritance now and in the future may that go down deep into the fiber of, who, of your being and inform all of your life bless you in the name of Jesus continue to sing
stand and sing this. Love. 